Praise God. Praise God. Aren't you glad that everything that we need to receive everlasting life has been given to us through Christ Jesus? Everything. Everything. There's nothing that I face that Jesus is not on the right hand of the Father making intercession for our needs. Amen? Praise God. That means a lot when you got somebody praying for you. And when it's Jesus praying directly to the Father, and then all of a sudden we need some help on earth, so all of a sudden the Holy Ghost begins to turn in us, and we begin to pray through groanings and utterances that we do not even know what we're saying, but we begin to pray what is the will of the Spirit, what is the will of the Father. They're joined together in unity, and we begin to pray, so not only do we have Jesus on the right hand of the Father, we got the Holy Spirit praying through us, giving us power and comfort and all. And then God the Father giving us in His ultimate wisdom whatever He desires us to have. Oh, think about it. Think about it. Okay, here's where we're kind of at. If you have your Bibles, let's turn real quick to Matthew 5 and 17 and 18. That's our text of where we're coming from. It, it's something that gets a little bit, I guess, a, a little bit confusing. If you have that, say amen. amen. Okay. All right. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Flip on over to Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter number 22. Starting in verse number 37, we'll continue to read. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We understand tonight that when Jesus came to the earth, it was to fulfill the next plan of God which was already thought up from the beginning of time. Amen? It was going to be the Son of God being born upon the earth and walking upon the earth and giving His life. And when He died upon the cross, He fulfilled everything up until that point that was in the law some of those things stopped this side of the cross. Some continue through. Does everybody understand? We don't have to offer up goats and sacrifice or sheep and sacrifices or bullets. We don't have to offer up and do the things that was under the law. As we explained last week, the law could not do anything to help you. All it could do is show you you were guilty. Amen. And how many knows that's a rough way to live? If you have to keep the law, and you think about it, they have laws about everything. How to deal with leprosy. How to deal with people with medical conditions. How to enter into the Holy of Holies. They had everything, which a lot of it was a type of Christ that was going to come, but it was still just the law. But listen, when Jesus died on the cross, the law stopped and grace became. Thank God for grace. Jesus came to fulfill the law. In other words, He said, everything that you needed up until this point to receive of God, I'm going to do for you. You don't have to offer up anything this way. You've got to offer it up this way. Amen. Come on now. It, it didn't do away with all the praising. It didn't do away with all the sacrificing. But what it did was, it did us to doing the physical part of it to doing the spiritual part of it. Now, 
wearing the grace of God. Which brings us to a place of now we're living in the dispensation of, the gra of grace, which up until that point was the dispensation of law. Now, Jesus tells them later on, you can keep the law if you want to, but if you're going to keep it, you've got to keep all of it. And I'm going to tell you this, I don't think it can be done except for one person, and that would be Jesus. Amen? I don't think there's anybody that can keep the law. Because see, there has to be something inside of us to be redeemed. If I walk around with the old man all day long, I'm going to sin everywhere I go because I need more. I need redemption. I need redeeming. I need this old man to be gone away and now a new creation in me. Amen? I need to walk with the Lord and understand that now is a greater responsibility than even during the law because sometimes living in this dispensation of grace, we can live in a cheap grace. And everybody's heard this your whole life. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus His life. He gave His life so that we could be set free. So we could be saved. And whenever we think about that, well then the Bible tells us, be careful. Because now we can ask forgiveness. And to be careful because whenever we ask forgiveness, and I find myself doing this as well, if we're not careful, are we truly sorry for what we're doing? Or are we just saying a prayer to cover it up for Oh, somebody say amen. That's good preaching right there. Amen. I don't want to cover it up. We're living in a time right now where the Lord's going to begin to deal with our issues. Amen. amen. And He says if we do not take care of them, He says I'm going to shine a light in it and I'm going to show it to the whole world. That's powerful right there. I'm going to tell you this. I don't mind anybody looking at me from the whole world. I just don't want them looking in my closet. Right. <laughs> Amen. Come on now. That's just a kind of a use of a word there. But you know what I'm talking about. We all got skeletons that were somewhere in the closet. We all have things that we don't want the papers to find out, much less our parents, if they're still alive. Amen. Because that's being caught and then reacting. But the Lord says, I want my people to feel my spirit and then act and get out of that lifestyle. Get out of that cheap grace. And we have, folks, we do. We have sometimes lessened the grace of God because we know. You ever heard of anybody preconceiving a sin? That means you really want to do something, but you know it's wrong, so you devise a plan that I'll go ahead and do it and I'll ask to just ask Jesus to forgive me about it later. Let me look up. Nobody does that, do they? No. No. What about back here in this end? Amen. We've all done that, amen. Now, I'm just going to be honest now. If you want to sit here and say that's never happened to you, be my guest. But you might need to go pray through the altar after church. Is over. Right. Amen. Praise God. Because we get in a place where we don't have a longing for the Lord and then other things begin to attract our attention. It's good preaching, ain't it? Amen. This kind of preaching. I'll, I'll, pre I'll preach in a minute and I'll teach in a little bit. So It's kind of like preaching. So. But anyway, now think of this. Matthew, in chapter number 5, we're not finished with that yet, but if you're in chapter number 5, verse number 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Go up just for a second and find my other scripture here. 
the two scriptures that we spoke about just a moment ago, if we can keep those two commandments, we do know the Ten Commandments come through the cross. I mean, yes, come through the cross because we know it's still wrong for all those things. Amen? And even some of them still law of the land, but some of them's not. Anyway, because of that, if we can love the Lord our God with everything that we have, fall in love with Jesus again is what we're talking about, in such a devotion that when we get up in the morning, the first thing we want to think about is the Lord. Last thing we want to think about is the Lord. After everything else, to have that relationship. And listen, the one thing that everybody always, they don't understand is this. The closer we get to the Lord, the better I'm going to be as a person. Amen? The closer I get, if I get, you know, and but the world looks like it at, at this. I, I remember a, a story about a lady that her husband would let her go to church. But if she wasn't at home by 8 o'clock, he locked the door and he wouldn't let her in. All night long. That's crazy. I thought to myself, how could people view church like that? But some people think that. Well, if you get close to God, then that means you're not going to be as close to me. No, that's not what that means at all. It means when you get close to God, you become a better husband and a better wife. Because the Word begins to infiltrate my heart, and now I'm becoming more like Jesus. You understand the process or the principle. See, the law could just say, okay, here's all the wrong things. But now in grace, we have been given the Holy Spirit to help us to walk through and to navigate through life that we can be what God calls us to be. And whenever we do, we'll not be jealous of God. But all of a sudden, our families will thrive. And all of a sudden, our children will realize they have the greatest father ever. The greatest mom. All of a sudden, the, the spouse recognizes they got the greatest spouse ever. Why? Because we get close enough to God and all of a sudden it makes you love everybody else around you that much more. Amen. Amen. I, I was thinking about that. Lord, have mercy. I know a lot of people today that would love their spouse to go to church. Amen. But you know what? All we can do is just ask. All we can do is love and say, hey, would you like to go to church to me, with me? Would you like to go to church? And I know it gets old asking that same question, but for us to realize that we're in the last days and we are the last chance that some people have. Amen. Okay. So, this is a lot going on and I understand that. But we're going to go on just a little bit further. So, if we can keep these two commandments, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment. And the second one is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, all the others have. If I love God, I'm not going to serve anybody else. If I love the Lord, if I want Him to be Lord and Savior of my life. I'm going to dedicate myself to Him. So all of that takes in the consideration of anything that has to do with dedication, consecration, or salvation. Amen? Amen? Everything. And then the other things that we see in the law has to do with doing your neighbor wrong. It's wrong if you take your neighbor's wife. It's wrong if you steal your neighbor's property. It's, it's wrong if you... Uh, you know, and, and just go down the list. And, and whenever we see that these things are wrong, well, if we love our neighbor, we're not going to want to harm anything that's happening. Can I tell you this? We should have neighborly love with people around us. And whatever they need, they should be like our family. I, I, and I don't know how, if we could ever go back to those days, being able to be neighborly, those moments when you need something and a neighborhood comes together, watching somebody that, that goes through a difficult situation. If we can love God with all of our heart and love one another, we won't break the commandments of God. Amen? There won't be 
anything that'll either that'll either uh, or anything that will will even attract us to break the promises of God. So therefore, now the Lord's going to take from there and see. We think that grace is going to make everything a lot. I'm not going to say easier, but what grace is going to do is bring in more responsibility to the church and everything before. Okay. All right. Let me get back down here to where I just was finished. All right. Let me just go ahead and read this again. We just read it just a minute ago. Matthew 5, 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How in the world can we get people in church teaching people wrong? I almost laughed there. You know why? Because we don't love God with all our heart. When we mess up in Scripture is whenever we go off on our own and say and do our own thing. There's not a person that's teaching tonight. I don't care if they're in the back. I don't care if you're a teacher in here. There's not a person in here that God does not give the message to His servants. Amen? Even the pastor. God gives me the word to give to this congregation. If He doesn't, and I do my own thing, then I'll be missing God because I won't be bringing this congregation what God said and they'll starve and go like it. So if I love God with all of my heart, it's going to make me want to be what God wants me to be. So whenever I come in to teach or to preach, to say, Lord, I want to be your vessel. Now give me what the people need and help me to convey it in a way that they can understand. Because folks, I'm going to tell you, I'm tired of coming in and leaving church and coming in and leaving church with the same stuff in our life that we've always had. Ooh, that's good for us. And there's, but the funny thing is, and I don't mean funny in a funny way, the funny thing is, you can get anything out right here if you want to. We don't have to carry it around. We don't have to drag it around. All we have to do is bring it to the altar. And the Lord said, if you leave it there, I'll take it and I'll, I'll dispense with it. Amen. But we live with those things. We live with them. But what the Lord is waking the church up. You, do you believe, could, could I make an accurate statement that the Bible tells us that it is high time for us to awake out of the sleep that we're in? Amen. Is that not what the Scripture says? Is that a Scripture in the Bible? It's high time for us to awake out of the sleep that we're in. How many can truly say that they believe these are the last days because God's fixing to pour out His Spirit and the church is waking up? Amen. Amen? I see it. I see it in people's hearts. I can see it in their eyes. I can see it in their words because they're recognizing that this life is coming to a close and we're not going to have very much longer. So it's time to fall in love with the Lord. All over again. Okay. Let me keep on going just a little bit further. In verse number 20, this is chapter number 5, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay, that's pretty heavy. Isn't it? So right here, here's what it says. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Jesus adds an addendum to that. That was the law. That's what the law said. But look at what is said in verse number 22. But I say, this is Jesus speaking, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. 
And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Think about that for a moment. So the Lord's bringing this to a more realization. And He says, or brings this in, and listen, here's what we're talking about. That thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. And hear the Lord say, now if you're angry with your brother, you're just as bad as a murderer. That's what Jesus is saying. He's calling us out even more. He's saying this. See, everybody thinks grace is going to be a lot easier. But He's saying, uh-uh. Not only, not only, but if you are angry with your brother, you're going to hell. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There are going to be a lot more people in hell because of anger more than murder. And I'll go ahead and say this today. There's going to be a lot of people that went that, that goes to heaven that never, ever, ever, ever would we imagine that they would have went. And there's going to be some people in hell that we thought to ourselves, if anybody would have made it, they would have made it. Because only the Lord knows the heart. And let me tell you this, it's easy for mankind to put on a face and to act a part let me tell you something, friend. It's time to quit playing church, and I'm talking to myself. It's time to quit playing church because we don't have time to play. We don't have time for foolishness because the Lord is, is helping us to receive that the enemy is coming against us and we've got to stand strong in these last days. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Okay, he didn't just stop there. And, and listen, isn't that, really what the, isn't that really how the Holy Spirit brings it to us? We see something in Scripture, then it takes it a little deeper. Amen? Let's see and, and, and realize Jesus takes another Scripture here. Verse number 23. Therefore, if, they, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Think of that. How many, and I'm just going to... I don't want anybody to raise their hands. Does anybody in here know the Scripture that you have done that? I've offered up a gift to the Lord. Come to church, went to the altar, knew I had all... Or, brother had all against me. And I offered it up anyway. The Lord said, uh -uh. you'd have been better off not easy to offer it up at all. Because you needed to leave that gift. Go take care of the things that's right with the heart. Because folks, it doesn't matter how we act on the outside. The heart is what the Lord is coming to look on. That's what He's going to look. And the Lord sees the intent of our heart. The intent of our heart. Even what we meant to do. He knows the motivation of why we did it. Why would I speak about all this? Because we need to make sure that our motivation is right. Not just to get a gold star, not just to say I'm going to heaven, but don't we really want to have a relationship with the Lord? Wouldn't any of us, and, and I'm just going to, you know, use different ones in the Bible to see how God spoke to someone and then them go to that person and speak that's going through the crisis and all of a sudden they speak some word of peace. And that person is peaceful because they know the word had come from God. Amen? When the struggle's going on. See what's happening. You remember we talking about being able to see clearly but it's time for the church to walk by faith again. That walking by faith is stepping out and hearing God's voice to say things to someone and then have the assurance that it's from God and tell them God spoke this to you. And to watch them build up faith and stand back up again and be ready to take on the next path. I'm telling you folks, if we could see in the spiritual realm what God does around the altars, 
I tell you, there's a lot of times I got up from the altar and I was a lot different than what I was when I went down. And I'm not just talking about spiritually, I'm talking about physically and spiritually. When I got up, I didn't want to do things that I used to do. Whatever brought me down there, I'm not taking it back with me. Listen, to get to that point in our life to say, Lord, all I want anymore is I want you. I want you. I want you. And through doing that, you're going to be what you have been called to be. Through that, you're going to do and be that that God wants us to be. Amen? Okay. So, and listen, whenever we're talking about taking that gift to the altar, let's answer this question. Should we bring a gift to the altar every time we come into church? I like to answer that for you. The answer is yes. That's right. We present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. So whenever we come in here, we have a gift. If you're saved, you've got a gift. And whenever we come to the altar, or whenever we come to that place that we pray tonight, whenever we offer that up, remember to yourself, every time you come in here, you're offering up a gift to the Lord. And literally all that gift is, what I believe that gift is, God has everything. The only thing that I can give Him is my heart. Amen? That's all I have to give Him. He has everything else. Everything else God has control over. Everything else God has the ability. But our free will. He said, I'm not going to take it or make you do this. He says, it's going to be your free will and you're going to come because you love me, not because you're made to worship me. Amen. Can I tell you this today? How many of us, would, if we really think about it, when we get up in the morning, could we really think of ourselves being like Adam, Adam and Eve? Cool of the morning that whenever we get up and we're that close to God that we walk. Come on now. In that bedroom, people think you crazy. You're in there talking to the Lord because you're walking with Him. Amen. Let me tell you something. The reality of it is this. The Lord becomes as real to you as any person who can see with your eyes. Your relationship with Him is real tonight. It's not false. It's not fake. It's not made up. It's real tonight, folks. Because He has washed away all our sins. He has taken care of all of our problems and all of our difficulties. And He's still a good God. And He's bringing us in here. And to think tonight that we're going to be talking about a gift, and I want to ask you, did you bring a gift tonight? You did. We all could bring one every time we want to if we want to. But sometimes our little bad attitude gets in the way and we don't offer God anything. Woo, this is good preaching today. Oh, uh, come on now. I can't even remember what it says completely. Uh, but there's a sign. It might not even be over that door anymore. There's a sign coming through that door at the back that says, Less attitude, more gratitude. I found it somewhere that, I mean, it was almost like a flea market or something, but I said, you know what, that's a good thing to put in front of the church. Because I'm fine in here worshiping the Lord unless my little attitude gets in the way. Right. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're still battling the flesh every day? That's called attitude. <laughs> you're fighting that attitude. When that person, whenever they pull out in front of you and you're doing 55 on a 55 and there's nobody in the next county behind you and they pull out right in front of you, but, but you'll know what's in your heart real quick. I'll tell you what helped me a long time ago. I just started singing, Jesus loves me. This For the Bible tells me so. Amen? I can tell you this. You might not think it works, but I can tell you this, if you can get out of that environment and get to a place where you can get your mind right, you'll usually be all right. But right now, everything is on edge. That's a good way to put it. Anybody, 
I feel like our nerve endings are just, they've been, they fired so much they just hurt. And I'm talking about, about life. And it just seems like the enemy is just coming in and just trying to do that much more. And you know what? But I tell you this, and I want to tell everybody in this building right now, we're watching systematically the enemy fight against families in this church. And it's going on right now. And if we don't touch God for families, we don't even know what might happen. Right. You know, our first response to that is, well, who is it and what is it about? Right. You know, our res correct response should be, it doesn't matter, let's take it to the throne room until we hear right. God say enough is enough. Woo! <laughs> I forgot to use the microphone. It's all right. I didn't need one. My wife tells me I got a big enough mouth. I guess I can't deny that one because the camera's on me too. All right. Let's go on down a little bit further. Verse number 24. This is a part of that. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Verse number 25. Agree with an adversary quickly. That's easy, ain't it? Agree with your adversary. Anybody know the definition of an adversary? You might as well say it's like your enemy. So here it says, be quickly to agree with your adversary. While thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost part of it. Verse number 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So here, we're going now, for having an adversary that there was a controversy over. And just the easiest way to put that, I'll just come from this direction. Yes. The Bible tells us to pray for those that despitefully use us. The Bible tells us to take things to the Lord. And that scripture, we see a lot of scriptures in the Bible that we miss kind of misunderstand what it talks about. And one of the scriptures talking about where it says that you can heap coals of fire upon their head when you uh, turn it over to the Lord and you don't take action, but you let God take uh, care of the difficulty. And then you read down later on and you find out that that was really a blessing because they used to put coals in a pot in the top of their head and they would cover it up with a wrapping and that would be a blessing that they could go to their house and start a fire in there. So it wasn't that you was going to heat coals of fire that God was going to burn them to death. It was we're going to learn how to bless our enemies. That was the real trick. We're going to learn how to pray for those that despite the police. In other words, our adversary, whoever they are, we got the love of God. We have everything we need to turn the situation into a hostile one. Remember everybody back up to the top of this? We're talking about Jesus giving the people on, you know, Him teaching about the peacemakers. We already preached about that. It's important for us to understand even in the world we live in, we're, we're meant to be peacemakers to everybody. Not just Christians. Not just people that agree with us, but to be peacemakers to everybody. And I can tell you this, if I take a little bit of moment and take a deep breath and hear from the voice from the Lord, He, he can usually work through the situations I'm in in my life if I will obey what He tells me to do. But if I try to rock that baby out myself, I can tell you this, it ain't going to end up being what I thought it was going to be. Because folks, even in these times, the only thing that we have that's going to be true is what the Lord tells us. That's what we got to remain. That's what we've got to live by. That's what we've got to continue. Okay, here, listen to this. Here's where I wanted to go. Praise God. Thank you. Alright. We're going back to this old time. Verse number 27. 
Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Alright, there's that, that law there. Jesus takes it one step further. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That's tough right there, guys. Because in in and that's using that phrase for man, but it could be woman there too. Because we are living in a world right now that is gone crazy sexual stuff. It dominates internet use. It dominates movies. And the Lord's saying this, be careful because I want you to know this. You might think in your heart to just kill some, to just murder somebody or just to see somebody, I'm sorry, not murder but to see somebody committing adultery, you know what? There's still books today that's on record. That it was at some time at one time all fifty states it was against law. There's still about five or six states that has adultery on the books that it is against law still. Well, can I tell you this? I don't care what the law says. God says it's wrong. Do not commit adultery. Look in that camera right there. Anybody doing anything outside of marriage is adultery and it's wrong. If you've got someone there that's connected in a marriage. Same thing with people going out just doing anything they want. It is something that is driving our world today and it's causing them to drive right into hell. Let me tell you this. We're going to be judged by it because the Lord says this. It's not just committing the act because whenever you look on her and you lust, you have committed that in your heart already. In other words, the Lord said when you did that, you already committed the act. It seems like grace would be easier, wouldn't it? But what God's saying is there's more depth. In other words, God is interested in what your heart is doing. What your mind is thinking about. Because He said that the, the Word of God is like a two-edged sword. It cuts this way and comes back, cuts, and goes all the way into the bone, dividing the bone from the marrow, even down, and it talks about to the very intent of our heart things that we do. What's the intent behind it? If we do something for somebody, what's the intent behind it? Well, folks, our intent has to be love above everything else. To love one another. And can I tell you this? I'm just telling you once again, if I love my brother or sister or whatever, because it's crazy out there now, Amen? There is all kind of foolishness going around. But it's to do one thing. It's to get us so aggravated and so mad that we sit down and quit and don't keep going on. I believe it. I, I, get, I, I started watching myself. And I started getting, getting drawn into some things. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, not only was I listening to it, I was being a spokesman. Come on now. I was sharing everybody else with it. But listen. All it did was make me aggravated and agitated. And all I did was sit down. And I'm going to tell you this. If you're agitated and you're aggravated, you're probably less likely to pray than if you were. Because I'm going to tell you, this is how it affects me. I get so angry, or, or not angry, but so agitated and to a point and it makes me just get mad and I don't care about spending time with them. Amen? We talked a little bit about this. You know, be careful what what you're getting in, the intake. I was I was that message that Brother Tommy had, had uh, given to us and he was saying be careful 
about the intake because we've got to get good news inside. That's why the Bible says that the Lord has given us good news. It's something to lift us up, something to encourage us, something to build us up. And everything in that's happening in the world today seems like bad news. Everything. Everything. And I'll tell you this, you might not believe it or not, but bad news sells better than good news. Amen? Sometimes, sometimes I'm thinking to myself, Lord, my day's been pretty bad. I think I'll go watch the news so I can feel better. <laughs> I ain't never come out of my mouth. I don't know about any of y'all. Now, I've had a pretty rough day. Maybe I need to go read my Bible. That's more like it. Amen? And can I tell you this? What we're talking about and what Jesus is giving us through the instru instructions, all of this, we got to self-monitor ourselves. Amen? Because you don't want to be stuck at the end of eternity and all of a sudden find out you wasn't going where you thought you were going. We've got to self-adjust ourselves. Amen?